I've been deeply moved by what I heard before I was given this opportunity. And I would like to talk just from the heart without going into what science tells us. But I think that would be a disservice because I think what we really need to do is to be moved to get mobilized on the strength what science tells us. Einstein was right when he said that problems can't be solved at the level of awareness that created them. Today, fortunately, we're in a position where we have knowledge on what our actions, what human society is doing to the climate of this planet. And it's on that basis I'd like to put before you a few facts that have emerged from the fifth assessment report of the IPCC, which is now nearing completion. And I'd like to make a case for religions, for faith, for spiritual initiatives to really make a difference and bring about a shift in the way we've been doing things. Because business as usual is not an option. And I'd like to just tell you a few things that might tell you why it's not an option. We now have 95% certainty that we are bringing about changes that are unprecedented. They are unprecedented over decades to millennia. So in a short period of time, human society has essentially brought about changes which have not taken place for thousands of years. Warming is affecting the atmosphere, of course, the oceans. The oceans, if I might say, since early 1970, have absorbed 90% of the heat that's been generated by climate change. And this warming has gone down to a depth of 700 meters. Now, you can imagine what this would do to marine life, to marine ecosystems. We already know that coral reefs have been damaged in several parts of the world. And this is an area where we really need to generate much more knowledge and understanding of what this impact on the oceans, including acidification, which is the result of absorption of carbon dioxide, is doing to marine life and to marine ecosystems. There's been reduction in snow and ice, sea level rise, has continued at a much faster pace in recent years, and there have been climate extremes. There are several drivers of change. Of course, some are related to agriculture, forestry, and land use, but the biggest source has been industry and energy. All of this, may I say, is leading to a very rapid increase in the emissions of greenhouse gases. In the year 2010, the world emitted 49 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. That's putting together all the gases and converting to them to what would be a common measure of CO2 equivalent. This is an increase of 10 gigatons over a period of 10 years since the beginning of this century. There are impacts on agriculture. There's possibility and danger of displacement of people. And climate change can also indirectly affect the risk of violent conf conflict because it amplifies the drivers of conflict like poverty and economic shocks. We know climate change is also slowing down economic growth and the more intense it gets, the more would be the serious impact, the negative impact on economic activities. We need to mitigate emissions of greenhouse gases. And often we are told that the costs are going to be terrible. It'll slow down economic growth. It'll lead to loss of jobs. But frankly, nothing could be different from this myth that is often spread. There are very low costs of mitigation, so much so that if we were to move on a pathway of reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, such that by the end of the century, we're able to limit temperature increase to less than two degrees Celsius. It will cost the world in 2030 a median value 
of no, no, no more than 1.7% of the total consumption of goods and services. So in other words, the loss to the economy at the most in 2030 would be 1.7% of the global economy. But there's good news associated with this. There are a whole range of co-benefits from incurring this cost, even if it were to take place. What are these co-benefits? There would be much higher energy security because by the middle of the century, we would have to move to trebling or quadrupling of energy supply from renewable sources because these are low in carbon emissions or zero in terms of carbon emissions. So there's a huge benefit in terms of energy security. There would be benefits in terms of much better environment at the local level. There's also evidence, growing evidence, of much greater employment with this pathway of mitigation that I'm suggesting to you. I want, I want to tell you about why there is a need for ethics, for faith organizations, for religions to take up this cause and make sure that all faiths, all religions, all beliefs are part of the solution. Otherwise, we have no reason at all to believe that we're not part of the problem. I'll tell you that we have found in a special report that we brought out in 2011 that global weather and climate-related disaster losses reported over the last few decades reflect mainly monetized direct damages to assets and are unequally distributed. The impacts of climate change are unequal. And unfortunately, they affect the poorest of the poor in the worst possible manner. I want to tell you that these monetized damages are actually an understatement of the actual damage that takes place. Even the monetized values are not small because since 1980 to the year 2008, uh, this value varied from a few billion dollars a year to around $200 billion a year in 2005. And that, remember, was the year of Hurricane Katrina. In recent times, we've had even more disasters. And I think the jury is still out in terms of what the economic cost of those disasters has been. And loss estimates are lower bound estimates because we, they don't account for loss of human lives, cultural heritage, ecosystem services. And all of these, of course, are difficult to value and monetize. And impacts on informal and undocumented economy, as well as indirect economic effects, can be very important in some areas and sectors. But generally, these are not counted. And if you look at a number of developing countries, much of the productive activity takes place in the household. And that's never reflected in the um, total economic output that's estimated and computed as part of the GDP. And it was this reason which I think was why Gandhi said, speed is irrelevant if you're going in the wrong direction. And most of us in several respects are going in the wrong direction. Now, during 1970 to 2008, over 95% of the deaths from natural disasters took place in developing countries. If this is not a reason for ethics and faith organizations to get into the business, I'd like to see a better reason being advanced. And the very likely contribution of mean sea level rise to extreme coastal high water levels uh, coupled with the likely increase in tropical cyclones, maximum wind speed, is a specific issue for small island states. Now, these are small entities all over the globe, ranging from the Caribbean to the South Pacific. These are small islands with some cases just a few thousand people. And you could very well say that as a matter, matter of convenience, they should be moved somewhere else because these islands are threatened by sea level rise. But if you move them somewhere else, you're also losing a cultural heritage. Are we not going to attach a value to that? Are we not going to attach a value to the fact that these people would like to be where the bones of their fathers and grandfathers are buried, and that they would like to bring up their children 
in keeping with the trad tradition of that culture. And these are issues that I think have to be part of the ethics which must motivate action in dealing with climate change. And actions that range from incremental steps to transformational changes are essential for reducing risk from climate ex extremes. How can we bring about a transformation? Only through the exercise of faith. Only through re religious leaders telling us that we have to transform. Because this power has to be a spiritual power. It has to be an ethical force that tells us that something is wrong, and therefore we have to move away from doing what we've been doing. And we know that, as I mentioned earlier, climate change is in indirectly increasing the risks of violent conflicts in the form of civil war and intergroup violence by amplifying these well-documented drivers of such con conflicts. These include poverty and economic shocks. Every religion of the world tells us very clearly that violence is bad. And those who pick up violence in the name of religion are actually deviating from the basic tenets of every single religion. We must remember that. I also want to mention that mitigation, as we know, would require changes in behavior, lifestyles, and culture. Because these have a considerable influence on energy use, and therefore, it is important for us to remember that our lifestyles, which largely are governed by what religion tells us, have to change. How would we change them? Through a variety of ways. Whether we use energy in the home more efficiently, whether we use more public transport, walk where we can possibly get to wherever we want to go, and of course, also by changes in diet because we have to look at all the options that in our lifestyles is imposing a major impact on the planet and its ecosystems. And there are many areas of climate policy making that involve value judgments and ethical considerations. So my appeal to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, who have gathered here for a cause which I think is very elevating for the human spirit, is to see that you speak out. And the plea that I would make is that by the end of October, we are bringing out the synthesis report, which is part of the fifth assessment report. May I urge all of you to raise your voices and to say something that translates into religious belief and action emanating from the science that is contained in, in that document. I think we have to, we have to take this real, real challenge in our hands and move forward in solving something that our children and grandchildren will never forgive us for. So I personally believe that not only do we need all stakeholders to get involved in dealing with this serious challenge, with this major threat and risk of climate change in every part of the globe, but we also have to ensure that all streams of thought, all types of beliefs, and every discipline of knowledge must be brought together so that we can solve this problem and make sure that we contain the damage that climate change is doing and is likely to do even to a greater extent in the years ahead. So the time limit over here and uh, the sign that I have tells me that I have just 17 seconds. I just want to end by saying that we all need to work together, and I'd like to say God bless you, all the best.